linked to these wider societal problems. So these are really the kind of things that I'm trying to speak to. Um, and energy can be seen as the master resource, and it affects all of these things. Uh, so the first visualisation I'm going to get up is just to um, show an infographic of how I um, kind of went about trying to measure energy use in transportation. So most academic work and especially policy documents only focus on this part of it. But when you think about the financial costs of a car, you don't just think about the fuel you're going to put into it, you think about all of this uh, other side of it as well. Um, and the same applies for energy. It actually costs a lot of energy to build a car, um, and that's usually not taken into account. So although in terms of energy, the fuel is a much bigger proportion, um, around about 60%, um, I've found a way of including the energy costs of maintaining the roads, building the infrastructure, building the car, and including that as a per unit distance measure. Um, in this presentation, I'll be um, focusing on the energy costs, um, the direct energy costs, so I'm mostly going to be focused here, but it's massively important to take into account um, the, the other side of it as well. Um, so just to try and put where we are into perspective, um, most of my data comes from 2001, and I think when you're using a massive data set, it's very easy to get absorbed into the kind of minutiae of where you are, but um, I think, as some of the keynotes have said, it's really important to try and take a big view and a big picture. So although this data set is actually quite low quality from, uh, in comparison with um, the 2001 census, it's actually massively important because it shows the scale of change that we're going through. So going back 100 years, we were uh, obviously very, very few cars, and that only started to appear. You, ha you had quite early on quite a lot of bus use and then walking and cycling taking up quite a lot of energy use um, and then you've just had a very radical shift away from the car so the reason I'm putting this in is to kind of put it in perspective in the time domain um, and it's very easy for anyone who's focusing on recent data to just focus on that little point but you can get data sources stretching back further um, I think that I don't have the reference for that up, but that's by uh, Pooley et al. 2001, and they did a, a kind of retrospective um, interviews of, of a sample of just over 100 people. So low quality um, in terms of the quantitative kind of detail in there, but very, very high value in terms of what it's telling us. So that's where we are. Where's it going to go in the future? This is the kind of thing that I'm trying to deal with. So I'm doing quite narrow, specific, dry techniques, but I'm trying to talk to a much wider problem. And this is, this is something that um, a lot of people working with data struggle with, how to get the actual message that's embedded in that data across. So this is kind of the, the first result that I got spatially um, in terms of energy cost per unit area. Um, and this is the result of um, the average distance by mode. So you've got um, a load of columns with cross-tabulated mode and uh, distance categories. And from that, you can work out how much energy, on average, each trip is using. You m multiply it up throughout all, there's about 99 um, columns, and then each one has a different energy factor. Um, multiply them all up and find the average. So you can see here, you get the kind of variability you'd expect. In the Greater London area, where people are much more likely to use public transport or walk or cycle, um, they're very green. And then interestingly, kind of to offset that almost directly, you've got the commuter belt surrounding London, where people are going very high distance. Um, and this is just kind of to show the, the mapping technique that I'm using. Instead of having uh, categories, I'm having a continuous variable um, with the colours, so you can get any variability within that. Um, and I'll show you how the, the techniques and the packages that I'm using to produce that kind of plot later. Uh, so obviously that's at a very core scale, but we've got this data down to um, the ward level, which is about 7,000 people in, in each area. And you can see that you do get a very complex pattern. 
So this is a useful finding because it shows that policies that are trying to reduce energy costs of travel to work should not be just as not just assume that it's the same everywhere. You get a ver you get a very complex picture, uh, but something that comes out time and time and again, which is illustrated. Unfortunately, they kind of cover them to some extent, but each of these dots is a settlement with over 100,000 people in it. And often, there is a tendency for the dots to be surrounded by green. So this shows you instantly um, that there's a quite, quite a clear spatial distribution to it. That's kind of to be expected. And I, in the PhD, I've done various kind of correlations and models to try and set, explain how this varies over space. But for now, in terms of transmitting information, let's just kind of stay with this and say, OK, it is a patchwork. And you can tell that it varies from place to place. And there's definite tendency for areas of high population density to be associated with low energy use. So that's another visualization. And then I think plotting, I think visualization is hugely important. It's not just important for transmitting your research to others or policymakers or kind of lay audiences. For me, it's been massively useful for me understanding my data and the kind of stuff that I'm dealing with. So I, this is an example of how I used uh, the data to uh, a, a plot to try and check, to validate if I'm getting the right kind of results. So here I've um, taken just the proportion of energy use by train. I've only plotted uh, polygons that are above the national average. So you, that's why there's so much blank information. And basically, if I got plots miles away from the train lines, I would know that th there was a problem. But this quite clearly shows that you do have kind of um, big train lines being associated with a high proportion of energy use um, being used by, by train travel. So again, it's useful for the researcher, not just um, the people that you're trying to communicate the information to. So then I kind of tried to take it further and I said, OK, well, megajoules per trip is not a very um, intuitive number. People don't use megajoules in everyday life. I could have used kilowatt hours but I wanted to make it as simple as possible. So I took my continuous energy variable and I converted it into a unit that I call the bath because that's the amount of energy needed to take a bath. And that's kind of fairly constant. And it's something that people take baths quite regularly. They're something in everyday life. So I wanted to connect with it. So I've just got a very simple R function in here, which is cut your continuous variable um, and then you do something to that variable, you multiply it by 3.6, which is how many, meg uh, how many megajoules there are in a kilowatt hour. So I'm converting it into kilowatt hours, and then multiply it by 5. And that's, there's 5 kilowatt hours in an average bath. And the reference for that is David Mackay, who's the um, chief scientific advisor at the Department of Energy and Climate Change. He's got a very good book out. And then you say, OK, one bath is 5 kilowatt hours. So then you... Um, set that as your new categorical variable and then that allows you to plot uh, travel to work in terms of baths and I think that's a kind of especially if you're talking to a non-academic audience that's a much more kind of intuitive result maybe if you were to do a kind of newspaper article based on this that's something that people can relate to I think better than the, uh, the, the kind of abstract issue of uh, megajoules and Personally, I find it interesting. I should emphasise this is a one-way trip to work. So you're talking two or more baths worth of energy just before you've even got to work. So that really hammers home how much energy is being used by, by your cars. And that's the average. Um, so, yeah, moving on. So all of these, a, a big downfall with these kind of chloropleth maps is that they assume homogeneity um, in each area, so each area has the same, but that is not actually true. You have a big distribution of individuals. So the technique that I'm using in my PhD um, is called spatial microsimulation, and that allows you to take um, aggregate level data, and then either you create, or what I'm doing is taking an existing data set of, at the individual level and allocate individuals to those zones. So what I'm moving on to talk about is this individual variability. So in any one zone, chances are you've got a w very wide spectrum 
of incomes in some a greater spectrum than others, but it just shows how dependent your travel behavior is on your income. So again, more visualizations to tell this story. Um, this one's from the National Travel Survey, um, and I just created a very simple plot um, in LibreOffice in this case. But what, what I wanted to do is show that even this has a spatial distribution. That's over the country as a whole, but if you take any particular place, you might have areas that have very high levels of um, inequality in terms of energy use, because uh, quite a lot has been looked at in terms of income, uh, and I wanted to see if that's the case. So using my spatial micro simulation technique, the, me the metric that I generated was the proportion of energy used by the top 20% of energy using commuters. And you can see it's got a massively strong and quite a kind of clear geographical pattern to it. So when you have city centres, this is kind of to be expected. You have very high levels of inequality. And you can see here in Sheffield, which is Sheffield city centre, you actually have um, <coughs> the top 20% using over 90% of the energy, which is a, a huge amount. But it's actually not that surprising when you think that not huge numbers of people live in the city centre and most people who do would, can just get out of bed and walk to work because that's where most of the jobs are. But you do have a small number of very wealthy people who are likely to go a long distance. Um, and then the other one is, uh, this is a little kind of settlement called Stocksbridge. It used to have a big steel industry, but now there's very little employment opportunities there. So people tend to have to travel to Sheffield and Barnsley. So almost everyone is traveling roughly the same distance. So what's amazing about these two areas comparing them is they have very, very similar levels of average energy use. So that shows that I've been masking the individual uh, variability by using these chloropleth maps. I find it a bit ironic that I'm using yet another chloropleth map to highlight the deficiencies of chloropleth mapping. So uh, maybe you should look into alternative ways of, of transmitting that information. But um, and again, they've got a paper that these kind of techniques are talked about in. So, um, talked about the current situation. What I wanted to do then was to say, okay, this is important stuff. It's linked to climate change and some of the big problems we're facing. So, how is it going to move forward? How is it going to change in the future? And this is where my scenarios come into play. So, I've called them kind of simple names to try and get the meaning of it in there. And I took it out of this London campaign. They've called it Love London, Go Dutch. So they literally want us to have Dutch levels of cycling. So you can actually turn that into a quantitative scenario. I spent three weeks in the Netherlands getting data from there. And basically, to keep things simple, I've got these um, assumptions, which are not completely uh, impossible. They're still we would still be slightly less cyclists than in, in the Netherlands. Um, but that allows us to generate a what-if scenario. So I did that, and then I reran the model to calculate energy use and look at its spatial distribution. And this is it at the level of Yorkshire and the Humber. So this is just one region of England. It goes all the way down here. But you can see, again, this has a really strong spatial distribution. Massively important to take the space into account here because if the central government in the UK, which is saying, oh, we need to pr promote cycling, they don't really think about this kind of thing. They just think, oh, put in cycle cycling all over the place. But they don't often think, OK, if you put in cycle infrastructure here, the potential benefit is actually very low. What they want to do is really focus on these red areas. And thinking about what causes these red areas, I um, plotted the centroid of each of the settlements. Um, the X is the, the width or length of the X bars are proportional to the population. And then I put a five kilometer ring around each of them. And that really kind of draws attention to um, where it is. The, I haven't done any statistics in it. It's just trying to kind of show visually where these places are. And this kind of stuff is massively useful for policymakers. If you've got a local authority with a few thousand pounds to spend on cycling, seeing something like this, and you can go at lower levels as well, can help decide which areas deserve that money. So another visualization. Um, I mentioned that I went to the Netherlands. And 
well, going back actually one. So you can see the spatial distribution, but actually for me as a cyclist and th being very pro-cycling, the energy savings were actually much lower than I was expecting. So even though it goes above 6% in some areas, the average is only about 3%, and that's after 8% of the population switch to cycling. Um, so I was trying to figure out why is it so low, so that led me to do a comparison with the Netherlands and England. And you can see I've distorted the scale, so obviously they're not to scale, um, but you can see that the energy costs um, are actually, when you, uh, do, when you average it out and population weight the differences, I found that the Netherlands have actually got slightly higher um, energy use of travel to work, something that I was really, really surprised about. And um, I'm working with some Dutch colleagues to try and explain the reasons behind that. But anyway, so cycling can't get a bigger benefit as we were hoping in terms of energy. So the next scenario was, OK, we're going to use technology and we can telecommute. This is something that's happening increasingly already. So um, let's take another European country as an example. Unfortunately, because so many people telecommute, it's actually a kind of almost a field of academic study in itself. So I just took these assumptions directly out of a study um, by some Finnish researchers. Won't go into the details, you can read those. Um, what's interesting is, this again, the spatial distribution. You can see it's very different from the cycling scenario. Um, and you have highest energy use. It's not only in areas that are away from the city centre, it's in areas that are very wealthy because the data in, the, in Finland suggests that th actually the people who are most likely to telecommute are in the top uh, social classes. Um, and then the next slide just compares that directly with an individual level implementation of the Go Dutch scenario. So you can see there that, that, that it shifts greatly over space. So, uh, a little bit about how I made these maps and how to make them reproducible. They're quite surprising results, and I just want to be as transparent as possible in how I generated them. So, um, I've got on the presentation, which I'm going to put up on my, on my website and also be available through here, these, these link through to the data sources, and in the case of the Dutch data, it goes directly to the actual hard data. You have to have an academic login for these. Um, and then I've done most of the analysis and visualization in R. And what that allows you to do is it's all scripted. So you have your input files in one folder. And then you just run a script saying, OK, load this in. Um, and then you can just follow the script and you can actually reproduce um, precisely the result that I've got. So if I click on here, hoping that I'm connected to the internet, um, it should pop up. And what this R Markdown code does is it allows you to run the code inside. It compiles the code and then pu pushes all the results into, um, yeah, it's come up into a HTML file, which obviously other people can uh, read. So I'll just show you that. I'll show you that. Um, and I think that's a great thing. And that's actually why I kind of shifted from. Um, QGIS to R to some extent because I found it easier to create reproducible research although I know now I'm told that you, you can do scripting in QGIS so that's not that's not an issue but it's something that I need to kind of learn more about and you can see just scroll down a little bit here I've lo I'm loading in the data so you'll see some uh, well there'll be some load things there yeah loads and L nll.r data and then you can see all of the stuff and they do some plots and I think this is even kind of moving towards the analysis side of what I've done but basically the point is that it's reproducible so moving quickly on um, some more key functions for mapping in R this is about open source software for um, geo applications um, surprisingly little technical stuff on R so I thought I'd throw some of this in in case it's of interest I guess one of the problems with R is you need quite a lot of disparate packages um, to load them all. So you can do something like this, create a, a, a vector um, with character strings that are the names of your packages, put them all into X, and then just say require X. So they're all the packages that I need in one go. 
that's useful because otherwise you have to go through loading them and, and I just have that in my initial file so every time I load up R on my system it loads those automatically. Another massively important thing, I don't know if people know how, uh, how to load shapefiles in R but you use this th command called read OGR, that's the correct way of doing it um, and that allows you to have an R object that is spatial. Um, this has quite a complicated data structure and because I'm really keen on using this um, thing called ggplot2 for visualization, um, but ggplot2 only, it, it has to have all the data in one format, and that's the data frame, which is a two-dimensional table. So here I'm using something called Fortify. When you use Fortify, everything is turned into a data frame, um, and that allows you to plot, and you add the data in. That is what you, allows you to plot things in ggplot2 and do mapping in R. So that's the kind of most technical slide, uh, really. But I want to take this further. So map, uh, R, one of the limitations, it's quite static. It just creates static maps. So this is something actually I produced in QGIS before I started using R so much. And it shows the time series shift. So obviously, the way you can represent it is just take snapshots in time and see the progression. I find it really interesting, 1981, in most places, less than half of the people travelled on their own by car. Obviously, it increased massively by 1991. And then moving on to 2001, you can see that um, not only has many more areas become dominated by the car, but it's almost as if the distribution has switched. So here, that's central York. But before, it was actually in the city centre where most people use cars. So that's just another kind of way of visualising it. With the 2011 census, I would be able to get 2011 there as well. Um, but that's not quite enough, just putting it on a screen. So to try and make this interactive, don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, yeah, doing okay. I actually made a little video to show this and to try and kind of uh, make it more interesting to people. But I don't think I've had that much success because it's been up for over a year and only 100 people have seen it. But um, it's just ideas that I'm putting out there and ways of trying to make it trying to make it work. So I'll, I'll just leave that while it loads. Um, so ideally, I'd like to be interactive. That one just links to something that Ollie O'Brien has done with the um, street map. So you want to be able to zoom around and see your own area and look at the data interactively. So I did have a go at that, and I created a um, Google Fusion table uh, based on some um, work by Dr. Uh, Alistair Ray. Um, and that, that's, I think that's really useful, potentially, if uh, you're trying to communicate your research to local areas. It allows you to zoom in to specific areas and, to some extent, query the data, although I've got, a lot, I've got further to go on that one. But that has big potential because that would allow you to put in a timeline as well, although I've just done it for the 2001 thing. So if, if you go on to robinlovelace.net, I've uploaded that map on there, so you'll be able to take a look at that. I won't have to seems like the internet connection is quite slow at the moment anyway. But it's not very flexible, so you can't do a lot of the things that you'd want to with something like GeoServer. And data ownership is it an issue. I don't think this is particularly sensitive data, but some people are saying if it's sensitive data that you're putting out, do you really want to hand it all over to Google and potentially the NSA? It's a little bit paranoid, but anyway. So. The other technique that I've tried, and I've succeeded in implementing it, but I haven't got it running at the moment, is you have something called an Amazon Web Server, which is where you have a virtual machine running through Amazon Web Services. Um, and that's fine, and you can just set up a GeoServer stack. Um, I wouldn't really recommend it for the kind of applications that I'm doing. I've got like quite not massive, fairly specific data sets that I just want to put up there quickly without having to deal with the problems of site maintenance and system administration. But it is really powerful. So, and it, you can you know, scale it to, to any size you want. So that's another alternative that I explored and did try implementing it, but to be honest, found it a bit difficult. Um, impact, so you know, why, have I, why have I talked about uh, these attempts? I've, I'm doing a, a topic that not everyone knows about or thinks about that much, so I think, I don't just want it to 
be my papers that I publish read by other academics. I really want to get the research out there. So this is a story about how I've tried to do that. And I must say, I have found, I have found people engage much better with what I'm saying if they see a nice visualisation of what I'm doing. So that's the story. I'm struggling to engage policymakers, um, but I think that's more a question of who I'm speaking to. So I think if I got, say, the um, local level maps of the impact of cycling, I think some people would be very interested in that. And I see it kind of as it's not enough to put your stuff out there on the internet. You know, people don't have time to look at stuff. It's kind of my responsibility to get that out there. Um, and hopefully it, it leads to increased accessibility and potential impact of your research. So to take it further, I would like to do some more geo-visualisation with processing, which is like a, a really interactive programming language that can work online. Flow mapping in R, so not only showing where energy uses are highest, but where the flows are going from and to. Um, and then you can take that down using kind of agent-based modelling to the road level, but this is getting quite ambitious now with the size of the data sets that I'm using, and comparison with other energy users. And that links back to the idea of comparing it with a, car, uh, with a bath. You'd actually be able to compare, what I have done actually is compared it with electricity use versus um, commuting energy use in different places. So just to wrap up, there's a range of visualisation options available. And now, with all this kind of open source technology, um, that the options are wider than ever. So really do take advantage, but think about and maybe learn from some of the mistakes and good stuff that other people have done, like myself. Um, so make it context specific as well. Think about who you're talking to. Um, and there are big advantages to be had from moving towards just static graphs and maps, um, especially in the age of big data. And one issue that I struggle with is getting caught up in the details of the code, but um, you really need to be thinking about what the, what the information is actually telling you. So people, when you present it, don't want to see the coding information, they just want to see pretty pictures. So that's it, really, from me. So thanks a lot for listening, and um, please look forward to any questions. Um, the, the previous slide, you said that. Yeah, I have actually done some. So I think I've got a GitHub repository that has some on there. So it depends on the, the format that your input data is in. So um, from um, it's, there's something called Nomis, which provides flow data. And that's in a matrix, which is in a flow matrix where you have all the um, origin, column, all the origins are as rows and then all the <coughs> destinations as columns. So you end up with a big matrix. What I do is I convert that into um, what's called a long table. So I have all the origin destination pairs and then I just um, allocate each origin with a coordinate and each destination and then run a for loop that, um, and the size of the line is proportional to the number of people so flowing. No, no, no. So NOMIS is, it stands for the manpower, it's not really, it's just an acronym and that's just a data dissemination portal operated by the government and I think it's mostly used by local authorities and stuff. So the question is getting the data. Um, I do have some figures I could show you of how to do it if you're interested. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could have some fun, like, you know, yesterday with weighting maps by population density to show mm -hmm. light on the same data. I think that could work quite well for some Yeah, data and in fact, I do have a, uh, a map. I think I, I should be able to show it now if we've got time. I've got, I do have one of these bendy maps um, of the population weighted Gastner and Newman things showing cycling. So, yeah, I think that's... I think that technique works very well when you're f more focused on what the people are doing than the actual spatial, like, re needing it being important to have accurate spatial coordinates. And in this case, yeah, 
I think that totally works. So I've done one visualization of that, but yeah, I agree. Good point. I think. Um, just have a look. You weren't tempted to use bananas as your unit. Uh, I was, but you'd need a lot of bananas. That because originally I was going to use a shower because people usually shower more frequently than take a bath. But showers one point four kilowatt, so you'd end up having loads and loads of showers in some areas. So a bath is actually when you think about it, you turn that tap on. You, I mean, I do it now. I think about how much energy is being pumped into that water. So I think bananas would be a good one, maybe for the cyclists. You could look at the energy use of cyclists. Um, And I do have, if anyone really wants to see a warped map of, I've just found it now. There it is. Da -da. <laughs> and that's uh, to show the rate of cycling in different places in the UK with the Gassner and Newman algorithm. So I didn't use it. I haven't actually included that in my thesis, but I think it's got potential. I think the problem is that people aren't used to looking at it like that. So if, it's the f if I'm presenting it to a new audience, then I probably wouldn't start with this because they'd just be like, what the hell? But if I'm presenting to an audience that's well acquainted, perhaps if these techniques become more widely used, then that would be, uh, be really useful. But yeah. Um, well, QJS ha used to have the Carto, um, it, like, Carto plugin, but then that disappeared for a while. So I might have used um, Scape Toad to do that, <laughs> but I, I'm, can't, I'm not actually sure, to be honest, in this particular one. So one of the two, certainly. So yeah, that's it, thanks.